Are you moving to the farm for the first time? Is that farm a generational farm? Your partner's family farm? Or a farm that you have invested in yourself with your partner? Today's episode, we're talking about a heritage apple orchard with over 300 varieties and first generations farming. We're talking with Grace about how her and her family chose to move away from the hustle and bustle to their heritage apple orchard, how they were able to purchase this property, the transition to the place, and how they're able to balance family life with their young kids, as well as continuing on in some of the roles that they were doing before. This is a really informative interview, guys, and we'd really deep dive into some great topics. So let's jump into today's episode. Hi, and welcome to The Farm. Today we're talking with Grace about you've married a farmer, now what? Today is a slightly different chat to we us- what we usually take. I guess you could say it is part two of talking with Sarah and Grace. Hi, Katya. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so a little bit my- about myself. Okay, so I am a nurse. Um, I oh, married another nurse. So I didn't marry a farmer. We, we both married each other. Um, And we both grew up on rural properties, um, but moved to metropolitan Melbourne to work. So moved back to the farm when we started having children, because obviously when you start having kids, it makes you think about your own childhood. You reminisce about all those awesome experiences of growing up, you know, on the farm and in the country. And that's just where I wanted to raise my family, really. Um, And when we were looking for properties, I was like, oh, you know, what? it'd be great if I could find something that had a few established uh, fruit trees. And I ended up finding something that had over 400 established fruit trees. And we actually inherited a heritage apple and fruit orchard as well to boot. So definitely heart full, hands full, everything full, you know, full pedal to the metal 100% of the time. But I actually wouldn't have it any other way. I absolutely love living in the country and, yeah, really appreciate that we're able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned you're both nurses. So tell me a little bit about your role and your husband's role. Yeah, so I am actually a paediatric intensive care nurse by trade. So mainly children is my jam. Uh, My husband works in more emergency adult type settings. He's done like psych and infectious diseases. So very two very different career pathways. And it's sort of like that with nursing. Like you say that you're a nurse, but you can be specialised in a very different area to another nurse. So luckily our paths have never crossed at work. I'm sort of glad about that. I I enjoy having my work life and my home life separate. So it's nice. Yeah. So now that you've on this heritage apple orchard, how does that work in with both your nursing roles and your family? Yeah. Yeah. How does it work in? Um, I don't know (laughs) that we do a very good job of it sometimes. I think, you know, we often look out the window and like we just see like the long list of things that are always needing to be done on the farm. Um, I think, you know, before we moved here, I didn't really appreciate how awesome apples were. Like I was sort of like, oh, you know, I went to the supermarket and I'd buy them and I'd eat them. But, you know, we've developed this real love of the stories of apples like it sounds a bit crazy but um you know when you've got like over 300 varieties you find out like about all those different varieties you find out like how old they are the little stories on how they were discovered or found and like yeah so we've we've developed this real love for all of our apple trees and they've sort of become an extension of my family in a way because I can't get rid of any of them Um, even though not all of them are edible some of them are cider varieties and some of them are just not really really can't be used for very much at all but because of their stories and I don't know because they're heritage and you know we might be one of the only farms in Australia that have certain varieties because they are not overly hardy sometimes and they do tend to die out after a period of time um we we hold on to them and you know people ask us for cuttings and they graft them to their own trees or they want to come and taste the apples if they're thinking about growing the apples themselves and 
you know, we're not a big market type, you know, conglomerate or anything by any stretch of the imagination, but I've actually found that through having the orchard, it's been a really great way to connect with our community and just connect with other people and find something, you know, in a common ground to talk to people about. And yeah, I don't know, just share the joy of apples, which is, yeah, it's totally not something that I ever anticipated, you know, getting really stuck into or fixated on, but it, it's been really nice. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, amazing. And so much that you've just said there to unpack. So okay. <laughs> where do we start? So you're doing your nursing career. You've decided to have kids. You're looking for a place. And so you said you were looking for somewhere that had the, the apple trees, looking for an established orchard. And then you also said that you sort of inherited this orchard. So tell me about the story about how you found it, how did you inherit it, how did that process go? Well, so we, when we started looking at where we wanted to live, like we were looking for a sort of area which we knew would be between both my husband's family and my family, so that I suppose we're trying to be fair and not be too close to one or the other because they both live uh, in country Victoria as well but in different areas. And so we sort of found this area, which is, you know, sort of gold fields type Bendigo area, Greater Bendigo sort of um, area. And we, I remember us driving through Maya Maya when we were scoping out potential places to live and just sort of saying to my husband, I really would love to live here. Like, I just really loved the valley that we drove through. There's a really old bridge that connects Maya Maya to Reedsdale that you go through when you come into the small township. And it just sort of, I don't know, like it connected with me almost immediately. Um, and then, yeah, a property came on the market and it had a full-blown orchard. And I remember saying to my husband, you know how I wanted to have some established fruit trees? Well, this one's got a massive orchard. And he's like, I don't know whether we can really take that on right now. And look, I tend to be quite an optimist. So I was like, yeah, we can. We can, we can take on an orchard. We can totally do this. Like, how hard can it be? Um, and so I twisted his arm and, yeah, we, we put in an offer for this place and, yeah, got it because I think the orchard did scare a lot of people. Like they saw it and they thought, I don't want to take that on. It is a lot of work and I'm not I, – look, I, it is. I probably was looking at it with rose-coloured glasses thinking how I would manage it all. It is a lot of work. I do acknowledge that, um, but it's worth it. It certainly is worth the work and we really love having – like these trees, some of them are – you know, 30 years old, that was when the guy who originally planted the orchard started, you know, thinking and, and acquiring all these different varieties. So, um, yeah, and as I said, they've all got stories. Um, my kids have grown up, you know, just heading out to the orchard in the back and picking a fresh apple to put in their lunchbox. They know the stories of the apples. If people come over, they're like, oh, you know, this is Cox's, or Cox's Orange Pippin, you know, and they'll like be like, oh, this is Sir Isaac Newton's apple and have this, like, amazing knowledge of all the different types of apples and I just I don't know I think that's awesome like I think it's just such a, a beautiful way to be connected to food and how it grows and you know understand the history of apples yeah yeah absolutely let's take a break in today's episode to give a shout out to one of the supportive links in today's episode the Thermomix TM6 book smarter not harder with the Thermomix TM6 and cookie do subscription this is the Thermomix exclusive recipe library with access to thousands of step-by-step -step recipes on the screen of your new Thermomix. Experience features such as menu planning and inspiration for food ideas, plus the freedom of cooking for your family and making their favourites hassle-free. The TM6 is your second hand on the kitchen, replacing over 20 different appliances in chopping, blending, whipping, weighing, milling, kneading, mincing, searing, surveying, and much, much more. Grace, how did you go about learning the stories, learning the varieties, and learning how to tend to your trees? Like, do you have someone who comes in and helps you with that process, or do you and your husband, have you taken that on as well? Uh, a little bit of all those things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when we bought the property, the previous owner, Peter, he was really supportive and I actually kept in contact with him and would ask him questions. And I actually really loved that little lingering relationship that we had. You know, he would send me emails and be like, oh, you know, the 
blackbirds will be nesting in the bay leaf tree now and the ducks will be, you know, having their babies on the pond or the long-necked turtles will now be emerging in the in the creek. And I loved having, like, his insight from his, like, 40 years on the property because he built this house and they were just getting they, – they were getting a little bit old and they recognised that they needed to move on. So he was very sad leaving, but I think he felt – really happy giving uh, or not giving his soul, but, you know, selling the property to us and our young family and seeing like that next generation, I suppose, come in and invigorate it in a different way. Um, and so, yeah, I would ask him a lot of questions about the apples and different things. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away not long after, you know, uh, selling the place. So I'm not able to sort of ask him anymore, but I've got lots of different resources that I refer to now and I've joined lots of different communities, which people are really happy to share their knowledge. And as I said, like this orchard connects me to connects me to other people in the community too, where people will be like, oh, you know, I've got fruit fly. What are you doing for that? And what about powdery mildew? And, you know, we all sort of ask each other and help each other. So I have a couple of people who live close by that will come and help me at pruning. Um, they usually, I usually say to them, if you prune the tree, you can have as many cuttings as you like. And they're usually quite happy with that. Um, my dad also, I have to give a shout out to him because he comes religiously every week and helps me in the orchard with a variety of different things. Um, we also decided with the orchard that we wouldn't, uh, that we would try and get it to almost like a permaculture environment as well. So we're moving it towards a bit of a different environment. There's chooks and guinea fowls in there. We're putting in biodiversity. You know, we don't use any sprays. We clear all of the windfall and apples and leaves by hand. So it, it is quite labour intensive and, um, you know, there is a lot of work involved. But I also really love the work. So, you know, it offsets my job that I have, you know, in nursing, which is very intense and, you know, can be very sad sometimes and, you know, very technical and I use my brain a lot with an activity which is very physical and it's outside and, you know, it's almost like a meditation for me to be able to perform. So, yes, it's hard work, but it's good because it's it's um, meditative for me. And I think not all of us are able to sit down and sit still and, and meditate. Um, some of us need to do and we zone out when we're pruning or we're, you know, doing more physical labour, some tasks, and that's definitely me. So, you know, it's it's very good for me in that way as well. Yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely. And so, you know, you've bought this, you're now a, basically a first generation apple orchardist, You'll, your kids will be the second, uh, should they choose to take it on as well. So tell me about adding the children to the farming environment of the orchard. Was there anything that you did need to change either physically or procedure wise to have a safe environment for them to be there? Yeah, definitely. You know, we, so we, before we were living on the farm, we were living rurally, but we were in a suburban block. Um, so obviously very different environment for children in terms of like what their scope can be independently in a backyard compared to a farm. So one of the first things that we did is we just spoke about where the safe areas were on the farm. So areas that they could go, you know, essentially without my permission. And most of them are within earshot. So I might not be able to physically see them, but I can hear them. So we established a boundary of which, you know, you guys can explore these areas um, without needing to refer to me. And then we also explored like what needed to be discussed. So where do you go with my permission? And I'm aware that you're there. And also hard no's, like you don't go there unless I am there. So, you know, those included things like into the livestock paddock or around the dam. And although I've got some children who are a bit older, you know, I've got a, an almost 10 year old and I've got a seven year old and they're both very good swimmers. I've also got a three year old and she will just mimic her older brother and sister. So some of those reasons that we have those rules there is because they haven't explained this to my children as well. She will see you doing it and she will, she will do that without that insider knowledge that that's unsafe. So we have those hard no's that just keep everybody safe, obviously. Um, and snakes are probably the other thing that we do bang on a lot about at my house. My kids are very much barefoot and wild. So they would lo they love to just run out the front door, leave the front door wide open and just, you know, run around like carefree. And I'm often running after them, put on your boots. Um, because we do have snakes on our property. I just found a snake skin in our shed yesterday. Um, we were clearing out an old couch and obviously the snake had got in there and was, you know, having a good old munch on some of the mice and decided it would shed its skin while it was in there. So, you know, it's a good reminder for the kids to say, look, you know what, you think that I'm making this up, but, you know, these 
animals, you know, they, reptiles, they're on our property and you just, you don't have to be afraid, but you just have, have to have that awareness about them. So, you know, you're not making it more risky for yourself when you're playing. So those are probably my main sort of things that I really focused on when we moved to the farm. Yeah. 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 So three kids, nursing yeah. <laughs> and the orchard. <laughs> How do you fit it all in, Grace? Well, I don't sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about that process. <laughs> uh, uh, look, I think it's just about like priorities. I can't do everything awesomely all the time so some things I'm doing really well and some things I'm doing mediocrely and I try and make sure that the thing that I do really well is the parenting the majority of the time so that'll just mean that everything else will come second um, and hopefully to a high enough standard that you know it's passable uh, but I also have really flexible work arrangements now. So though my core skills are as a paediatric intensive care nurse, I live too far away from metropolitan Melbourne to be able to do that with shift work. So I actually work, like I have my own business and I work for a medical education business, which is really flexible. Like they are awesome. And I'll be like, today, I'm not going to get any work done during the day. It'll be at night. And they'll be like, that's fine. So I think I've been very beneficial. Or like it's been very beneficial for me to have very understanding um, work environment that I can flex around what I need to do, which means that I can be present during the day for my kids, take them to school, pick them up, you know, around for my toddler, fit that in around my husband's shift work. Um, and then, you know, all of the other stuff has to just work in around that as well. And look, yeah, look, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I'm like, you know what, I really should have pruned a few more trees in this dormant season, but I just didn't get to it. Um, and I just have to accept that, that, is sometimes how it ends up. It's not exactly how it would be if that was the only thing I was focusing my time on um, because I have many balls in the air. Yeah. Grace, do you have practices around that letting that go and, and like forgiving yourself in some situations? Like it's okay. Do you have any processes around that that you've developed to make it easier? I think it's practice. Like I think – you know, when we first moved here a few years ago, it used to really stress me out. Like I would just be like, I want that done now. In fact, I wanted it done like a month ago. And yeah, like it would really, really stress me out. But I think, you know, we got to a point, it was probably about six months ago now where we were like, do we actually need to sell this place? Like, is it too much for us? And, you know, we gave it some very serious thought. And in the end, we thought, well, we could sell the place or we could just accept that what we do, if we're doing our best, is our best. And that at the season in life with our three children and our jobs and all of the other pressures that exist on us as young, a young family, that that doesn't look the same as if our children are older and more independent or, you know, if they've left home. And this is just how the season looks for us right now. So, yeah, I think, like, you, you get your head to a point where you do eventually sort of let go of it and then that forgiveness becomes easier because you've sort of already said, you know, I accept, I accept this reality <laughs> because the other reality is that I don't live here, you know, and that we, we go back to living on a suburban block again, which would be heartbreaking for both me and my husband, I think, now at this point. So, yeah. Yeah, and looking forward to that future. In the future, we will be able to do and have <laughs> yeah all those grand plans that's it yeah amazing that's um really great insight grace thank you so much for sharing that and so while we're sort of back on you know time of life and balancing things out so we've touched a little bit on you know the nursing practice side of what you're doing now so I know a lot's changed in the last fortnight. So tell me a little bit more about what you and Sarah are up to and then tell me the exciting news that has just recently happened and um, explain, you know, to our community and our listeners that initiative that's coming up. Okay, yeah, cool. All right. Um, well, I suppose when we moved, both Sarah and I, we sort of moved out from Metropolitan Melbourne at similar times. So we've, got, we've, had, we've had a sort of similar career trajectory and also what's happened in our family life has been very similar and we've worked together for a long period of time so it's been really lovely to find somebody on a similar path to you it's very actualizing 
Um, and we at the same time sort of realised that we weren't, it's not sustainable for us to be continually going into Melbourne, but we really love, you know, what we've done with our careers, you know, how we've, how we've skilled ourselves up. We love working with children. Um, and so we turned our minds more to, okay, well, how do we take those skills that we learnt in a metropolitan area and then help that benefit the communities where we live? Like, how do we take that back out to rural and remote communities within Victoria? Um, and so we developed, we, we co-founded a business, which is Peds Education, and we really try and focus in on that around, you know, building the capacity within communities for children's health. So it can be, you know, basic baby and child first aid courses, um, or it could be training up schools, you know, with how to look after children who either from a basic child first aid course pr perspective or if they've got comorbidities, so kids who might be going to school with um, diabetes or epilepsy or something like that. And also like care teams. So, you know, if you yourself have a child with a disability in rural Australia and you want to train up a bit more of a team so that, you know, you can go to the supermarket or you can go back to work or you can help with the harvest or something like that, we come in and we we train up those people, you know, so that they are really competent and they can, ad not adequately, but look after your child to the standard that we would expect our own children to be looked after. We have very high standards there. So, that's been really wonderful because it's been such a positive way to take the skills that we've learned over time and put them into a really proactive approach of keeping kids at home and in the country and, you know, knowing that they're less likely to have to travel into metropolitan Melbourne for training and for appointments and all those sort of things. So that's been really great. Um, but, yeah, while I was doing that with Sarah, one of the things that really stood out to me very quickly was we weren't really able to capture everybody particularly with our sort of baby and child first aid courses, there, there was a, it's a real challenge to get people to come to courses in rural and remote um, areas. Even if we've got them available, the attendance rates can be quite low. Um, and so I sort of went away and with my sister developed a charity to try and really address that, that issue because what I recognised, you know, in my time in the ICU, I did a lot of work in quality and safety and, you know, improving KPIs and, and that behavioural change and understanding barriers to why people might access education and training. And I thought I've got to apply that to this situation and go, why are people not able to attend courses and how do we remove those barriers? Because we have kids safe, we have people coming out and providing training, we have lots of different providers, but it doesn't put the bums on seats and it doesn't improve mortality rates for children in rural and remote Australia. So why is that? And so my sister and I formed the Sisterhood Project and the great news that you're asking me, the exciting news, <laughs> is um, this charity, which, you know, it has been another baby that I've birthed in the last few years, um, along with myself, was recognised as the Victorian AgriFutures Rural Women's Award for this year. Um, so that has just been, yeah, yeah, it's been a whirlwind. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's been a whirlwind. It's been great. It's been exciting. But I think the best thing that's come out of it is that people now know about us and they're reaching out and they're saying, hey, I've got a community. How do we, you know, get you guys in so that we can deliver these courses? And we're, you know, talking to them about, okay, well, let's make sure we've got some childcare for the parents, you know, so they can come in, you know, when's harvest time? Let's make sure we don't run it around then, you know, what else is going to make it easy for mums to get off the farm and to a course? And, you know, how long should the course last for? And what else do we need to do to make sure that they go, this is super easy. I can come to this course. I want to know this. And and now they've made it really easy for me to attend. So I don't really have any excuse. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's absolutely amazing. Congratulations on that. And amazing work on how the project is, is going so far and the efforts and the work that you've put into it. It's going to be, you know, an incredible opportunity for those in rural remote Australia. So I'm really excited to, to watch that, that roll out over the next little while. So congratulations. I know that everyone listening along will um, be very happy for you as well. Oh, and thank you. So how do you run the sisterhood along the sisterhood charity along everything else that you're doing at the moment? How will that look for you in the future with the with your family, with the nursing, with um, the heritage apple orchard? Yeah, I mean, when people tell me about like all these things back, I'm like, that does sound difficult. But um, <laughs> look, I don't sleep very much. There's probably that. I'm one of those people who doesn't need a lot of sleep. So if anyone out there has children that don't sleep very much and a low sleep needs children, okay, that that was me as a child. And I've just brought that with me into adulthood. 
And um, I, yeah, I do work when I'm not sleeping. <laughs> um, but no, seriously. Uh, look, I have a really great board of women that I've brought on because we're an incorporated charity. So we're registered with the Australian Charities and Not for Profits Commission. I have a great board of women who, my sister as well, who are, like we're all volunteering our time and have really gotten behind making this happen. And also the whole, the charity works on the premise of collaboration. So although I have a business where I provide this education myself, it's not about me providing the education. It's actually about me collaborating or us as a charity, collaborating with everybody out there who's trying to achieve these goals and just uh, removing barriers and facilitating that education to get into places. So it might not be me that comes out and it can't be like, especially if we want to get Australia wide, which we do, we're going to have to be able to, you know, engage with providers that are closer to these areas because look, I've got this goal in mind of how many people we want to teach every year in every state. And if that's going to be achievable, it's through collaboration. And that actually really excites me as well, because I think, you know, for a few different reasons, and, you know, we have this opportunity to take all of these skills in people that are no longer in a metropolitan area that have then moved into regional and rural areas and to put them out into the community to improve health outcomes for children. And we also have this ability to collaborate and work together with people who would normally be your competitors. And I just think, you know, for the sake of children's health outcomes, like how, what's a better way to sort of approach this? And, you know, yeah, so I'm really excited about all that. And we've had a few people jump on board now. Um, I don't know if I can give them a shout out for also jumping on board with us. Is that okay? Or... Yeah, that's more than fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, great. So we've had CPR kids in New South Wales who have jumped on board with us. Um, Help at Hand Education, which is based in Melbourne. And then uh, we were also talking to Rhythm First Aid, uh, which is she's out in Melbourne as well. Um, so those are three providers that have already jumped on board and said that they're going to help us in the next 12 months to deliver some courses. So um, thank you to those people. And obviously, PEDS is definitely on board. They have no... Uh, they're not wiggling out of it. They've got no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Today's sponsor is Pediatrics Education. At Pediatrics Education, they provide pediatric training to empower you when caring for your child. They provide services and resources, including child and baby first aid courses, baby and child first aid online courses, pediatric complex care training, healthcare, school programs, and also host the Small Talks podcast. On this podcast, they address being a parent is a juggle, but what about when your children has an illness, an injury, or a disability? They chat with parents, carers, and health professionals to shine a light on these issues and what it is that we as parents can be doing as well to help support our children. On the PEDS website, they also have free paediatric resources that you can download and print, plus regular tips on their social media channels. So please click the link in the description below for their website and their social media channels. These are resources that are so important. Thank you very much for Sarah and Grace for being on the podcast today. Now let's jump back in to today's episode. Grace. That's an absolute whirlwind of what you're up to and everything you've been able to achieve. Uh, I know we've talked about, you know, slipping work in every moment that we don't sleep or that our kids aren't sleeping. So is there any other tips, tricks and advice you would give to someone who is looking at setting themselves up in a similar situation, becoming a first generation farmer or starting with owning an orchard? Like what are the tips and tricks that really make it achievable for you? Wow. Uh, all right. Uh, look, I think everyone's going to be different and yeah. we all have such different personalities. So I think what works for one person may not necessarily work for another person. But look, for me, like the things that have worked for me is, look, I acknowledge that I'm somebody who likes to be busy. So I know like often when we talk about this, people are like, well, that is a lot. But that's, that is certainly my choice because that's what I like to do. Like I, I'm high energy, don't sleep much. And so having multiple balls in the air, like it, it actually brings me a lot of joy. I feel really fulfilled by doing lots of things. So that's what I want to do. But, you know, people may not want to do that and that's okay as well. Like if you want to just focus on a couple of things, I shouldn't say just, if you are focusing on a couple of things and that's filling your cup 
and that is enough for you, then that is fine. You don't have to be doing all the things. You know, don't compare yourself to another person and think that you're not doing enough or that you should be doing more because it's just not the case. Like, you know, it's I'm me and you're you and we're all very different. Uh, if you are like me and you do like to take on a ridiculous amount of things, so uh, I would say, you know, give yourself lots of grace. Acknowledge that sometimes you're going to fail because when you're doing multiple things, you don't always have the attention for all of the things. And so sometimes it doesn't work out and that's okay as well. Like everything doesn't have to be uh, working out 100% of the time. Just make sure you know where your priorities are at. And for me, that's my family and my children. So that's always my under uh, overarching goal and value that I pin everything else on. If they need to be happy and healthy and as a family unit, we need to be functioning well. Otherwise, none of the other stuff really matters for me. So I think because I always come back to that, like I can very easily let go of anything else because I, I, I come back to that mantra, you know, what's my most important priority? If it's my kids, well, then that's who gets my attention for the day and everyone else can just wait. Um, and, yeah, look, as I said, but that's what works for me. And I think also the other thing which I've it's taken me a while to learn, but since I've learned it has been incredible, is asking for help. Um, I haven't been very good at that in the past and would just, you know, carry the load on my own often. But very recently, I've been trying to very consciously say I'm struggling at the moment. I've got too much on my plate and I need some help to whether that be my family or whether it be my work colleagues or whoever I need the help from. And that helps as well for a couple of different reasons. Maybe they don't need to do anything other than just go, all right, I know that she's just not going to be doing things very well this week because she's got other stuff on her plate. Or it might be that they say, how can I help? Can I come and look after the kids for a couple of hours? Um, do you need to go on a date night with your husband? Like what do you need to, you know, just give yourself something else back so that you're feeling it, you, you've got that capacity again? So, look, yeah, I'd probably say those would be my main tips. So, you know, don't compare yourself to other people. Um, accept that, you know, sometimes failure is an option if your priorities are in the right place. And don't forget to ask for help if you need it. Yeah, they're absolutely fantastic. And I do always like to say, you know, even if you've given something a go and you've failed, it's not really a negative because you've given it a go and you've learnt along yeah. the way. And if you do choose to come back to whatever it is that has not worked out, you've now got an incredible amount of knowledge that you can apply to that. Or exactly, you know what, it may not have worked out because it wasn't really something you needed yes. to do. So I love yeah all those tips that you've gone over and yeah definitely learn which are the glass balls that you don't want to drop and what what are going to bounce what can you pick up later I love that so much yeah excellent well Grace that probably leads us to the end of today's interview was there anything else that you wanted to share with the rural mom community about taking on the apple orchard and taking on life and family that you think might be helpful for them to hear Oh, gosh. Um, no, I've just really appreciated uh, the time, Katja, to be able to speak to you and really love, you know, what you're doing and, you know, sharing these different stories. I think it can be really isolating sometimes being a rural mum and, you know, what we go through. It's very different. You know, it's a different type of unique experience. So it really helps to hear other people's journeys. And as I said, we're not comparing ourselves, but just to, you know, get a bit of a sense of camaraderie. So it's really beautiful what you're doing and being able to highlight that through, you know, this podcast. Thank you very much, Grace. Everyone, that is the end of season five of So You've Married a Farmer, Now What? We have explored so many stories, tips, tricks, hacks and advice along the way. So whether you are a first-generation farmer, a multi-generation farmer, you've moved to the land for the first time or back into your family farming operation, we know that there'll be advice that you can take from this podcast and this YouTube channel. While we take a break in preparation for winter to get everything ready, please feel free to go back and watch any episodes that you may have missed or back to those favourites that I know that you have saved. And we will see you back here on the 20th of June for, season, for episode one, season six. Until then, everyone, great winter preparation.